and over. And uh, then further on, I re finally retired from the Air Force and uh, joined the Boeing Company, where I was assigned to the Minuteman program, where I was responsible for the configuration accounting of all the nuclear fleet of Minuteman 1, 2, and 3. And uh, during that period of time, I also learned about incidents involving nuclear weapons. The one incident, for example, was they, they actually photographed the uh, UFO following the missile as it climbed into space and shining a beam on it, which uh, neutralized the, uh, the missile. And this was recorded. It was all hushed up. They split up the team that observed it. But, of course, eventually the, the news came out. And it was later published and confirmed it. Lieutenant Colonel Arnie Arneson was present at a strategic air command facility when one of these objects on radar was seen. He also learned that the intercontinental ballistic missiles were rendered inert during this and a related encounter. His testimony is corroborated by another military official, Robert Salas, who was present also at Malmstrom Air Force Base during an extraordinary event. The testimony of these two men as well as the supporting documentation, establishes the reality of these objects and that they did have a deep concern with our nuclear facilities. In addition, they demonstrated that if necessary, they could render these intercontinental ballistic missiles inert. I was a crypto officer for the entire uh, Ramstein Air Base. I was a top secret control officer. And in that capacity, I happened to see a classified message go through my comm center which said that a UFO has crashed on the island of Spitsbergen, Norway, and a team of scientists are coming to investigate it. I do not recall where the message came from, where it was going to, because in that capacity, we were oftentimes told, what you see here, leave here. But I can recall seeing that. The next thing that comes to mind is one that took place in 1967, I was in charge of the communication center at 28th Air Division at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana. I was, <clears throat> again, the top secret control officer there. I dispatched all the nuclear launch authenticator to the SAC missile crews and whatnot, so I had a very good top secret background to, you know, to go on. One night, or one day, I should say, I happened to see a message that came through my communication center. There again, I cannot quote the date, where it came from, where it was going to, but I do recall reading it and saying it's that basically that a UFO was seen near missile silo numbers, I can't recall, but it was hovering there, and it said that the crew going on duty and the crew coming off duty all saw the UFO just hovering in midair. It was a metallic circular object and uh, from what I understand, the missiles were all shut down. They were in the missile silos and they were being, I don't know what SAC does as far as activating a missile is concerned, but it's basically on a standby mode so it can be launched. But when they say it went down, it means that it went dead. And something turned those missiles off. And so they could not be put in a mode of launching. The event, the incident, I guess I'd, I call it, is uh, happened uh, on the morning of March 16th, uh, 1967. As I recall, it was early in the morning, um, and I got a, I received a call from my topside uh, security guard, and he said that uh, he and some of the guards had been observing some strange lights flying around the site. It wasn't more than, uh, well, within a few minutes, I'd, I'd say, uh, maybe a half hour later. He calls back, and this time he's very frightened. I can tell by the tone of his voice. He's, he's very shook up and said, Sir, there's a, there's a glowing red object hovering right outside the front gate. He said, I'm looking at it right now. It's a glowing red object. I've got all the men out here with their weapons drawn. Uh, and of course, he was all shook up while he was telling me this. He was very excited. I immediately went over to my commander who was taking a, a nap. We have a little cot down there. It's 
in a rest period. And uh, I was telling him about the telephone call we just received. Then, and as I was relating this to him, our missiles started shutting down one by one. Uh, there were approximately uh, anywhere from six to eight that went down, but they went down in rapid succession, which again is a extremely rare. And in the meantime, I called upstairs to find out what the status was of this object. Try to, and uh, the, the guard said, well, the object has, has left. Um, it just, just left at high speed. Uh, Echo flight is another squadron about, I'd say, 50, 60 miles away from our location. But they had the same sort of thing happen. They had UFOs that were uh, hovering, not, not the launch control facility, but the actual launch facilities where the missiles are actually located. Uh, they had some maintenance and, and security people out there at the time. Um, and they were, they were observed, the UFOs were observed by these people out at those sites. Now they lost all 10 of their weapons. So that morning, we lost anywhere from, you know, 16 to 18 ICBMs. Um, uh, at the same time, UFOs were in the area and were, and were observed by uh, airmen. This incident was of extreme concern to SAC headquarters uh, because they couldn't explain it. Nobody could explain what happened. There is another incident that happened just within a week of this, week after, where there were radar re reports and uh, quite a few more witnesses. So we all turn around, and they're sitting about, a, I'd say, a half a mile from the tower, and at about 3,000 feet, was three silver UFOs, you know, sitting in a farm with two here, then one covering the center. Once they started moving, they went straight up, you know, for a while, and then they went zap. And they was off our scope, and our scope would go out to 260 miles. Mm -hmm. And so that you calculate that, and that's pretty fast. I called headquarters, and the guy, on the phone, and he says, I said, okay, we got a contact. And he says, you mean SAC is running a mission against you? I said, not SAC. Not SAC. What then? I said, Cosmos. Said, Wait a minute. He said, scramble on your phone. So there's a switch you could throw that scrambles everything in my hand. And I said, okay, my phone's scrambled. Yours scrambled. Mine's scrambled. You're taking pictures, taking pictures, taking radar pictures, taking radar pictures, taking real pictures. He says, okay, don't say another word. He says, I will send a courier up there. He'll get there in about six hours. You turn everything over to him. We are never officially ever noted for those pictures, that they ever received those pictures. It was just went secret, it went black, like it never happened. And what we saw were three very bright, but independent lights, I, I, I mean three separate lights. We assumed they were independent, and they were in a perfect, um, uh, I, I, I guess, is a, I, equilateral, a, a perfect triangle. The, um, the curious thing about this formation of lights that caused us to watch it for an extended period of time, um, 10 or 15 minutes we watched it, was that first it was silent. Second, it was moving slowly, but in a perfectly 
constant altitude, perfectly constant velocity, and perfectly constant direction from north to south. When I arrived at the command post the next morning at about 6.30 in the morning, um, it was unusually active and unusually well staffed. Um, in fact, it was a beehive of activity and there were people that, who had obviously been there most of the night. And it seems that these lights did position themselves over the alert force of B-52s over the alert pad where there were a specified number of B-52s um, configured for their wartime mission. And, and these lights were very interested in that wartime configuration, it would appear. And as, as sorties returned, I was told, by those who had been there overnight, uh, they were asked to close and try to identify, close with and try to identify these lights. And um, this included B-52s, KC-135s, and even some of the F-106 interceptors that had been out doing their particular training missions as well. And the pattern was the same. Each time a, a, an aircraft would approach, the lights would depart in ways that defied any aerodynamic knowledge that anybody there had. Just rapid accelerations, rapid uh, changes in direction, uh, including vertical, and uh, ju just doing things that, uh, something that is flying by the rules of aerodynamics that we understand would, would not have been at all possible. This whole event uh, took from beginning to end probably in the um, in the range of six and, and, and perhaps more hours. And in retrospect, it is curious how quickly that's, that subject just was dropped. It just wasn't discussed. When I was a commander of a radar squadron up in Maine at Caswell Air Force Station, Maine, we were right next door to Loring Air Force Base, was where they launched the B-52s and the, the KC tankers and things like that. <clears throat> I had a lot of security friends over there at Loring who told me about, and I have no first-hand knowledge of it, but they also had seen UFOs hovering near the uh, nuclear weapons storage area on Loring Air Force Base. And a lot of my, uh, my technicians that uh, worked for me as a communication electronics officer they would tell stories about things going across the radar screens at fantastic speeds, you know, they, they were not, <clears throat> nothing could go that fast. I was on mid-watch uh, during uh, my second med cruise, and uh, it was about, oh, sometime between midnight and two o'clock, and I had a contact come on the radar scope. I knew the difference between surface search radar and air search radar. There's differences in polarity of the radio signal and things like this and how the waves come back, all the stealth kind of stuff, you know, active and passive electronic countermeasures. So I know the difference between a flock of uh, geese or, you know, wave returns or um, false echoes. In fact, this was the first thing that challenged me to check it out in ECM as to whether or not the contact that I had on the scope was genuine. Because this was between uh, 65,000 feet and above, and the strength of the signal was as strong as the surface contact on the water of an aircraft carrier. This, this contact was huge. It was, um, got my attention and the attention of others that were on watch. There were four enlisted on watch and two officers at the time. And so anyway, in this particular case, um, it was showing up on height finding equipment and it was showing up on radar equipment. And then it began to move uh, fairly slowly at first and then very quickly. The um, CO came in and he wanted to know what the heck was going on here and they looked at it and asked what the hell was that, you know, and it got the attention of the captain at that time was Captain Clark was my captain. My commander was Commander Gibson at the time. And um, 
there were only, was only one person on watch in ECM. And before I knew, in a matter of, oh, 15 minutes, the ship was being turned and two Phantom 2s uh, were being prepared for launch. The 